Let us pray. Gracious God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our stubborn hearts, calm our distracted minds. So as the scriptures are read, we may hear the word beyond the words and respond with our lives. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. May these words be channels of grace into your hearts. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, we are beginning a new sermon series called Blessed Are You, the Promise of the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are eight blessings offered by Jesus at the start of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' sermon. It's not just what somebody wrote about him, but these are his very words, his very teachings, what he wanted his followers to hear. And Jesus begins his sermon with a series of blessings, what we in the church call Beatitudes. And over the next eight weeks, we will be exploring each of these Beatitudes, asking what they mean for us, how they impact our walks of faith, and we'll be seeking to understand the promise that each of them contains. Each Beatitude is a promise of blessing. Jesus is telling us the good news of what God is doing in our midst right here and right now. Not off in the future, but now at this very moment. God is blessing you. Each one of us, each one of these Beatitudes helps us to put the pieces together of who Jesus is and what he's all about. The Beatitudes are gospel they are good news, not just good advice. Jesus didn't come to earth to write a cute little self-help book to make you feel good about yourself. Je this is not about being happy. Jesus is talking about God blessing you today. And he begins by telling us, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What on earth does that even mean, Jesus? If you look at your screen, you'll find a picture I took of the place where tradition claims that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. There's a beautiful church built on top of the mountain there. All throughout that church are plaques with the Beatitudes in every language of the world, even fictional languages like Star Wars from Star Wars and Star Trek. The mountain overlooks the Sea of Galilee. It's just an incredible setting. Now, I want you to imagine yourself there 2,000 years ago. You are a first century Palestinian peasant. Come to hear Jesus preach. And if you're anything like 99% of the rest of the population back then, you and your family are living off the land. You are farmers of some sort. Perhaps you're terribly in debt, or perhaps you're just getting by. Most people back then were either getting by or in debt. You are living hand to mouth, and you are one natural disaster, one war, one injury, one honest mistake away from being in serious trouble. On top of that, your nation is occupied by the Roman Empire. They take a significant chunk of your crops and your income. The religious leaders of your day, who you hope to hear a message of hope and courage from, preach instead a message that God favors the rich and the powerful. Life is hard. You're always on the brink, and there never seems to be an end in sight. And it's into that tension. It's into that general sense of anxiety, into that despair even, that the Son of God Almighty preaches, blessed are the poor in spirit. Let me bring in a few other translations to help us. Blessed 
are the hopeless. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are the spiritually humble. And my personal favorite, blessed are you who are at the end of your rope. Blessed are you who are at the end of your rope. To the hundreds, if not thousands of people there that day, constantly dangling at the end of the rope, what a breath of fresh air Jesus Christ must have been. But how can this be, we might ask? How can you be blessed when you're dangling at the end of your rope? Well, it's because when you're at the end of your rope, when all else fails, when your health, your money, your marriage, your friendships, your jobs, when all the things we put our trust and our security and our hope into, when they slip away and you find yourself at the end of your rope, you discover that God is still there with you when you have nowhere else to go, no other options on the table, nothing else to trust. God is still there. When all the ground around us turns into sinking sand, we have two options. We can sink further down into despair or we can plant our feet solidly on the rock that is Jesus Christ. Blessed are you who are at the end of your rope because there you have found the rock to plant your feet on. There you have discovered what it means to put all your trust, all your faith, all your hope into the Lord. Blessed are you who find yourself strapped to a dialysis machine three times a week. Blessed are you who have run out of options. Blessed are you who are on a breathing machine. Blessed are you barely holding the pieces together. Blessed are you living paycheck to paycheck. Blessed are you who barely made it here this morning. Blessed are you who are at the end of your rope. For you know what it means to let go of all else. And to trust in the Lord. To trust in the gospel. Each and every one of us here this morning will come to the end of our rope. That might be you today. That might have been you many years ago. That might be you in the future. Blessed are you. Regardless, though, this beatitude has much to teach all of us. Why we should not seek out misery. We should not voluntarily be at the end of our ropes. The faith of those who are there can inform our walk of faith because Jesus himself embodied this quality. Jesus himself was poor in spirit. Jesus, as we see in the Gospels, embodies all of the Beatitudes. And there are three lessons that the poor in spirit teach us that will make us better disciples. Three things that those who are at the end of their rope remind us that we should cultivate in our own walks of faith. Three lessons for us to remember so that our feet will always be planted on the solid rock of Christ. And the first thing that you must remember is this. You must remember what brought you to God. You must always remember what brought you to God. Now, I'm going to say something sort of controversial here. Don't pot, don't hit the X button on the screen. I'm going to say something sort of controversial. One of the biggest roadblocks, dare I say, the most insidious threat to your relationship with Jesus Christ, it can be your own spirituality. One of the biggest threats, if not the biggest threat, to your spirituality, to your, relation, to your relationship with Jesus Christ, can be your spirituality. The threat can come within. Well, how can, you, how can that be, you might ask? We'll take it from a pastor, from somebody who went to seminary and spends almost every day dug in deep into these matters. As you immerse yourself 
in the practice of prayer, in the study of scripture, in the life of the church, as you engage in missions in the community, flexing your spiritual muscles, if you will. So oftentimes we develop this bizarre sense of amnesia that blocks out that sense of spiritual hunger, spiritual bankruptcy, spiritual humility that drove you into the loving arms of God into the first place. And that hunger, that humility is oftentimes replaced with this unhealthy sense of spiritual pride, spiritual entitlement. Think about the Pharisees. We're all recovering Pharisees, friends. When that happens, our faith stops being about Jesus, but starts being about how great and how holy and how righteous I am and how wretched and unlovable and sinful everybody else is. When that happens, church stops being about worshiping the Lord and loving our neighbors, but starts being about my agenda, my vision, my standards, my building, my beliefs. Spiritual pride is a cancer of the worst kind. And the only cure for spiritual pride is remembering the sense of what brought you to God in the first place. The only cure for it is a little bit of spiritual humility. Or as Jesus in the King James put it, being poor in spirit. A few months ago, as we were preparing to move up here to Weaverville, I had a phone call with one of my mentors, Reverend Gary Mahathy. Many of you met Gary a few weeks ago. He was here with his wife, Judy. Gary was my pastor in college and has led me through this long process of becoming a Methodist minister. Gary is the best pastor that I know, hands down. He gives the best, wisest spiritual advice. He lives out the gospel every day. He knows his Bible, history, and theology better than anybody. And he's a mighty fine preacher. So naturally, on this phone call, I was seeking out his advice. I asked him, how do you do it? How do you stay grounded? How do you not get lost in all this amazing work that the church is doing? How do you love your people well? How do you stay grounded? I was expecting Gary to quote an ancient theologian or recommend yet another book to sit on my shelf or a class for me to attend. You know how I am. I'm a doer. I like to go do things. But what Gary said shocked me, which was every day as I drive to work, I say a simple prayer. And that is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Blessed are the spiritually humble. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are you who remember what brought you to Jesus Christ in the first place. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ, have mercy on me. On me, a sinner. We must always hold at the center of our faith what brought us to the feet of Jesus. You must never lose sight of how you came to know him when you were at the end of your rope. Now, the second thing that we must remember is this you must remember what you will take with you. You must remember what you will take with you. Did you know that Luke's gospel has its own set of beatitudes? They're sort of different from what Matthew gives us. Jesus in Matthew tells us, blessed are the poor in spirit. But Jesus in Luke tells us, blessed are the poor. Jesus in Matthew is preaching from atop a mountain, while Jesus in Luke is preaching from a level field. Think about that for a moment. Isn't that something that Jesus, the Son of God, from a level playing field, says, Blessed are the poor 
That should make us think. In Luke, Jesus also throws in some woes, some curses. Woe, curse to you that are rich. I don't think that Luke's Jesus cared as much about getting butts and seats, keeping people watching his online sermons, keeping tithing up and raising money for the parsonage. There's a lot to unpack with the differences between Matthew and Luke's Beatitudes, the difference between poor and poor in spirit. But there's also a few significant points of overlap for us. First, the majority of people in Jesus' day were both poor and poor in spirit. Secondly, the poor in spirit, those at the end of the rope, because of the hand that life has dealt them, are under no illusions about where their help comes from. They know that one day when you meet your maker, you can't take any of your money, any of your property, any of your accomplishments, any of your earthly treasures with you. All these things that make us arrogant, that inflate our egos and our pride, the things that make us self-righteous and convince us that we have the right to be judgmental, the things that make us be jealous and resentful towards our neighbors. None of these things can save you at the end of the day. None of those things will matter at the end of the day. You won't be able to take them with you when you go, friends. Indeed, people will remember you for how you loved them, what kind of spouse, parent, grandparent, neighbor, friend, co-worker that you were. But the only thing that will not fade out into oblivion is Jesus Christ. So we trust him. We place our hope in him. We live out his teachings because everything else will fade away. This morning I ask you, what is holding you back? from fully trusting in him, fully living out his teachings, from experiencing life to the fullest. When life is all said and done, friends, those things won't matter. You can't take them with you. They won't help you be a better parent or spouse or any of those other things. Give it up. Let it go and put your full self into living life. Put your full self into what will matter at the end of the day. And the final thing that we must remember is this. You must remember to open yourself. You must remember to open yourself. Frederick Buechner, one of the great theologians of our time who just recently went on to glory wrote of this first beatitude we live our lives like a big clenched fist the clenched fist can do many things it can work it can hang on to things it can impress it can even fight but the one thing a clenched fist cannot do is accept, even from the good God himself, a helping hand. A clenched fist cannot accept from the good God himself a helping hand. Many of us live our lives with a clenched fist. And it's only when we come to the end of our ropes and we have no other options that we learn to open up that clenched fist and fully receive the blessings of God to be lifted by the helping hand of God. God's love lifts us up. It's very difficult to put into words what that feels like. It's hard to explain to somebody what that means. It's beyond our capabilities to do so. But I know there is somebody watching this video today who can testify about God's love lifting them up, about God's grace carrying them through, God's mercy turning their life around, about God's peace shepherding them through, God's faithfulness giving them courage. God can change your life. His hand is there, reaching out to you. All that you got to do is unclench that fist. Accept his blessing. Take his hand. He will change your life. 
And God's not waiting for you to fall to rock bottom, to come to the end of your rope before he reaches out to you. God always meets us where we are. His hand, his open hand is always there. Our problem is that we live our lives with our fists so tightly clenched that we don't receive his blessings. We try to do it on our own. We don't need them. We don't need help. I got this. We don't let them lift us. Friends, unclench those fists. Open yourselves to the Lord. He will lift you up. When you take God's hand, when you open yourself to receive God's help, you'll also find that you are more willing, more able to open yourself to others. You'll find that when you see your neighbor hurting, your closed fist will naturally become an open hand. This is where all of that kingdom of God business comes into play. Remember, Jesus says in this beatitude, bless her the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, as the rest of the Gospels put it. Jesus talks about the kingdom an awful lot. I would argue that it was the chief concern of Jesus' earthly ministry. Almost all of Jesus' parables are about the kingdom. The kingdom is like a mustard seed. The kingdom is like a banquet. The kingdom is like yeast. The kingdom is like scattered seed. Jesus always talks about the kingdom coming here and now in almost all of his sermons. Today, this morning, if you prayed the Lord's Prayer, you prayed for the kingdom when you said, Thy kingdom come. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is not some far off hope in the sweet by and by that we'll experience after we die, after we fly away. Jesus tells us that the kingdom is breaking into our world at this very moment. It's both out in the future, but it's also present, unfolding among us, elusively dawning among us, here, but not quite here yet. If that sounds complicated, remember, Jesus himself couldn't even put it into words. He talked about it in parables. It's too good for our comprehension. Perhaps the kingdom is what we hunger for above all other things when we don't know its name, or realizing it's what we're starving to death for in our souls. The kingdom is where our best dreams and our truest prayers come from. We glimpse the kingdom in our moments where we find ourselves being better than we are and wiser than we know. We catch sight of the kingdom when at some moment of crisis, when a strength comes to you that is greater than your own strength. The kingdom is all around us. It's slowly taking root, growing like scattered mustard seeds, like yeast, making the bread rise. And it does that through us, through you. Jesus calls us to build the kingdom, to make God's reality our reality. And Jesus tells us that it's the poor in spirit, the spiritually humble, who will inherit God's kingdom. Now, I've been praying, friends, a lot these last few weeks, as I've been researching this sermon and outlining everything, I've been praying a lot about how to hit this home, how to explain what this means, how to illustrate what the kingdom and being poor in spirit, how, how they relate together. And I just couldn't think of anything for the past few weeks. And then Tuesday morning of this week, Tuesday morning of this week, I received news there's someone very dear to me, somebody who taught me a lot about faith, had gone on to glory. I received news that my friend, Wally Maltzby, a member of Maple Springs United Methodist Church, where I attended in college, had gone on to glory early Tuesday morning. He was 96 years old. 
Wally was one of the first people that I met when I started attending Maple Springs. This 90-something-year-old man made a point to introduce himself to me and invite, invite me back after my first Sunday there. And there was something about him, I can't put it into words, he just oozed goodness and love that made me want to come back to that church. And I did. And as I got to know Wally, I learned that Wally knew a thing or two about being at the end of his rope, about being poor in spirit. You see, Wally grew up in the Winston-Salem Baptist Children's Home, an orphanage. And when I asked him about it, if anybody asked him about it, he would say, God blessed me. God blessed me with a family of 500. There were so many blessings there at the children's home. Wally unclenched his fist early in life. He went on to serve our nation in World War II and was married to the love of his life for 64 years before she passed on. And even after her death, after coming to the end of his rope once again, Wally continued to open his hands to God's blessing and open his hands to others. One way that he did that was he would bake cakes for people. Wally was an excellent baker. And he, he would bake his famous seven-up pound cake for people in the church or people in need or people who just needed a cake in their lives. He'd bake around 100 cakes a year and just give them away to people. Wally well, also volunteered in the church's food pantry every single day that it was open. Our paths crossed there frequently. Wally, who once again was in his 90s, would serve as the sort of public's bag boy for all the people coming there for their food. He'd bag up their groceries, carry their carts out, load them into their trunks, and say a prayer with all of, the, all of the customers at the food pantry. Every Friday, we'd have a couple thousand pounds of food delivered to the church. And a group of us would come out to unload it from the truck into the basement of the church. It always took a few hours. It was hard work. And this was work that mostly younger folks and recently retired folks were doing. But you know what? Every single Friday, Wally was out there too. Cane in hand, 90-something years old, loading food onto a dolly with his other hand. With Wally... It was never about him. It was never about him. Wally is one of the most spiritually humble people that I've ever met. Because of him, because for him, it always came back to showing God's love for others. It always came back to showing Jesus' love for others. Whenever we talk about the kingdom of God, I think sometimes we get intimidated and we try to make it too complicated. And that's why we say it's for the next life. But that's not what Jesus preached. What Jesus was trying to tell us is that each of us has the capability to bring in the kingdom, to be kingdom builders. And part of what he was saying is that it's not great rulers, political leaders, religious leaders who bring the kingdom in. It's normal people like you and me and Wally who are ushering in God's kingdom at this very moment. I like to think that whether he knew it or not, Wally had one foot in the kingdom of God most of the time. And with every seven up pound cake that he baked, every newsletter that he put a stamp on, every conversation he had with this arrogant 20 something year old intern, every load of groceries he carted up from the basement, every prayer that he prayed for the needy, he was ushering in God's kingdom. That's who we are called to be. That's who Jesus calls us to be. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who live life with open hands, receiving God's blessings. Blessed are you who open your hands to others, sharing those blessings in abundance. 
You are building the kingdom. Blessed are you. Amen.